King James Version of John chapter 9. And as Jesus passed by, verse 1, and as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, verse 3, Neither hath this man sinned, nor his parents, but that the works of God should be manifest in him. The works of God should be manifest in him. What I want to focus on tonight is the impact, the impact on people. We're, we've been talking about relationships and want to continue this train of thought, how that the word of God, the works of God, the miracles of God, how that men and women are impacted positively and some negatively, unfortunately. But we're going to read how that, regardless of the impact, the Word of God makes an impression, impacts, and influences men and women. And we'll see this throughout this chapter as well. So I read to you the first three verses of John chapter 9. And it talks about how that Jesus, or let me go back to John chapter 8 last week. So in John chapter 8, it started off how that Jesus was in the temple. He was in the temple in chapter 8, verse 2, and he sat down and he began to teach the people. And in teaching the people, the woman was brought to him who was caught in adultery, on and on and on and on. And we read how that the, the conversation and the impact on the people, be it the Pharisees who brought this woman to Jesus, the people who were in the midst of the temple listening to Jesus. So we read how that all those folks were impacted. So now in John chapter 8, verse 8, um, verse 59, I'll read it to you. And this is kind of the conclusion here. Uh, it is the conclusion of John chapter 8. It says this, Then they took up stones to cast at him, being Jesus. But Jesus hid himself, and he went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. So then it, it continues on. It continues on in chapter 9. And I made a note to myself how that they were in Jerusalem, still in Jesus was still in Jerusalem, him and his disciples, and how that because he left the temple, because he left the, the place of worship, if you please, the physical place of worship, collective worship, the temple, or as we call it ourselves as Christians, the church, we read in this chapter that the miracles of God, the word of God, the impact and the influence from the word of God doesn't stop um, outside of the physical building. It continues on. It's still influencing men and women, still impacting individuals, still uh, inspiring individuals. So in chapter 9, it, it starts off and it lets us know that Jesus had left uh, verse 59 of chapter 8 and then he passed by and as he was as he hid himself and he was still going throughout the city of Jerusalem that he passed by this man and Jesus saw that the man was blind saw that the man was blind and notice in verse 1 he saw that the man was blind from his birth so not only did he physically see um, Jesus being omniscient knowing all that not only was this disability as we call it referred to it this handicap this infirmity if you want to call it that um, was from this man's birth as we look at the Word of God some of these words and how it's it's laid out the scriptures therefore impact and they're giving us the details so this didn't just happen and then a miracle comes in and corrects it no this man was blind from his birth. So now in verse 2, so again, verse 1, the emphasis is that the, the, the power of God, the works of God, 
the miracle working power of God, the supernatural occurrences, they happen outside the church. So what is the message there? We go to church, we experience things in church, emotional moves, God speaks to us, but it's not limited to that. It's not limited to that place. God moves outside, and that's where we we have that relationship with God, right? We have that relationship with God, and that relation, our relationship with God is not determined by a location or a place or people around us. Our relationship with God him speaking to us, him moving in our lives, him opening doors, etc., etc., is a day to day, throughout the day experience. All right. So now, verse 2, John 9, verse 2. And his disciples, so we know his disciples are still with him, his disciples ask him, saying, Master, who did sin? Who did sin? So now they're looking at who's the blame for this? And I'm going to bring up a topic, and maybe we'll, uh, if someone has a question on this, we'll look at it. Uh, we, we hear the terminology generational curse. So we can look at this verse of scripture, as well as others, and associate what many have talked about within the Christian community, outside the Christian community, generational curse. So they asked him the question in verse 2, Master, who did sin? Who's responsible for this man's of physical impairment, his blindness. Was it his parents? Was it this man himself? Well, Jesus, the Bible just tells us he was blind from birth, from birth, in that, in that innocent state. So they're asking the question, uh, was this man responsible for his, his blindness, for his physical impairment, his visual impairment? No, he was, he was this way at birth. And then they go on and they say, or his parents, that he was born blind. So as you read this verse too, it doesn't make sense. The question, part of this question doesn't make sense. Was this man responsible for his, his phys, uh, visual impairment or his parents because he was born blind? So not to focus too much on that, but... That's just a little footnote to say it's so easy for man's reasoning to say, was it this? Was this the cause? The blame, the, thing, the blame game, the finger pointing versus looking at this as an opportunity for God to bless. And that's what Jesus brought them back to. So um, people associate generational curse. It's because my mom sinned, my dad sinned, their grandparents sinned. I'm experiencing what I'm experiencing. Well, let's, let's look at the cup half full versus half empty. Let's look at it from a positive point of view where this is an opportunity for the mighty acts of God to be revealed in me and through me. And that's what we'll see here in chapter 9. So verse 3, Jesus answers, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents but that the works of God should be manifested in him. Just what I had said. So he immediately dispelled generational curse. He immediately dispelled it wasn't this man's fault. It wasn't his parents' fault. But the purpose of this is so that God's power can be revealed in and through this man. Therefore, giving him a testimony, a testimony that not just that God opened the Red Sea, but a living, walking testimony of the works of God. So as we look at this verse, and let me just spend a little, a few moments on this verse, and you can write these scriptures down, you can refer to them. The Bible tells us in Psalm 150, Psalm 150 verse 2, it says, praise him. For his mighty acts. So Jesus healed. Jesus is going to heal this man as we read in the Bible. And it presents an opportunity for the Lord to be praised. Praise him for his mighty acts. Psalm 150 verse 2. And not only that. Again. It causes. The cause and effect is for him to have a testimony. Now a testimony. So we, we have opportunity to praise the Lord for his mighty acts and also 
a testimony comes as a result of this. So a testimony so that Jesus is lifted up and other men and women are drawn to him. So the Bible tells us this, and I'm going to give you a few scriptures. So this man, praise him for his mighty acts. It is a mighty act that's going to be performed in this man's life. As a result of praising him, as we read here in the Bible, this miracle is going to open the door for Jesus to be lifted up. In John chapter or John chapter 3, verse 14, Jesus speaking to Nicodemus of that relationship, he says, even as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So focus on the word lifted up, and how do we lift up Jesus? Our testimony. More so than my preaching, more so than anyone's preaching, more so than anyone's teaching, but our testimony of what he's done, what he's doing in our lives, speaks volumes, preaches great messages, right? So John chapter 3, verse 14, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man, Jesus, be lifted up. Why? Because when you're lifted up, high and lifted up, all eyes are drawn to him. Jesus reiterated those words in John chapter 12, verse 32. We haven't gotten to it, but just moving ahead. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto him. So as we read here in John chapter 9, and they asked the question, whose fault was it? Who's the blame for this man being blind? Jesus said, no. It's so that the works of God can be manifest in him. So people will see it, people will recognize it, and people will be drawn to the one who performed the miracle, Jesus Christ. All right? So that was, again, John chapter 3, verse 14. And then a uh, companion with that, John chapter 12, verse 32, talking about lifting up Jesus. And then 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, it says, paraphrasing it, always be ready to give a answer to them, uh, be ready to give an answer to any who ask of the hope that is within you, or be ready to share your testimony of what God has done. Again, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. So here in this particular verse, this is Bible study, it's how we break it down and we associate those other scriptures, right? John 3, 14, Jesus being lifted up. John chapter 12, verse 32, Jesus said, if I be lifted up, the results will be other men will be drawn unto me. How does that occur? Um, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, our testimony. Always be ready to give an answer of the hope. The hope is we're looking forward to anticipating with expectation not only what God has done, but what God's going to continue to do, right? Because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, Hebrews chapter 13. So we get all that from verse 3. So now, in looking at that from a, a Bible study perspective, and this is why I'm showing it, uh, sharing it with you, as we're reading the rest of the chapter, we'll keep those in mind as we read the various scriptures. All right. So again, Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be manifest in him. So our personal testimony is impactful. Our personal testimony is powerful. God uses your personal testimony, my personal testimony, what he has done, what he is doing in your life to minister to others. We are all walking sermons, if you please. All right. Let's move on. Let's go to verse 6. In verse 6, in verse 6, he goes on, When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. So now we see the process of this healing, what Jesus did. And we know from reading in other scriptures, he didn't have to go through this process. He, he could have just spoke the words. But again, we see we read what the process that Jesus went through and he spat on the ground made clay and he anointed the man the eyes of the blind man with clay in verse 7 and then he told him go so Jesus did his part and we have to do our part right he said go and wash in the pool of Siloam which is interpretation 
sent. And the man went his way. So now we also see obedience. He went his way, therefore, and washed. And he came, seen. So Jesus did his part. We see the process of the healing. Jesus does his part. And it is our responsibility to obey and do our part. Do our part. So Jesus anointed his eyes with the clay from the spittle. Um, and then uh, he told him, gave him instructions, um, follow-up instructions. And I think that's a very key point for us as Christians. It's, you know, God will do his part. God can do it all. But he wants us, and I'm going to use the word, partner with him, to be co-laborers with him, to be joined and unified with him. We have a responsibility to do our part, to obey, to obey the instructions that he presents before us. We have a follow-up responsibility, follow-up responsibility. Go and wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. All right, here we go. So let's go down to verse 8. Verse 8. And we'll notice here in verse 8, the neighbors, therefore, the Bible says, and they which were which before him had seen him, that he was blind, said, Is not this he that sat and begged? Verse 9, some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him. But he said, I am he. Verse 10, Therefore said they unto him, How were thine eyes open? So here in these particular verses, we notice that people's attention, people's curiosity is aroused. And oftentimes the miracles of God, as you read throughout the Gospels and, and in the book of Acts and other places uh, in the Old Testament, when God performed a supernatural act, which we call a miracle, it, it, it arouses people's uh, curiosity. Who did this? Who did that? Why did he do it? And they began to ask all these questions. They began to inquire, even as we do, right? So the word of God, in order to, oftentimes, in order to uh, influence and impact, it arouses man's curiosity. So our lives, and Peter shared it, um, I believe it's First Peter, he says, don't think it's strange, right? People will think it's strange because you have changed. Basically, what it's saying is that because there's been a change in your life, it's arousing their curiosity. Who changed you? Why'd you change? And that's where I believe, personally, I believe God wants people to be because now they're in a, a state of mind of inquiry. They're inquiring, and it opens the door of their heart for the Holy Spirit to really speak and the Holy Spirit to really minister and the Holy Spirit to draw them to Jesus because our very lives are lifting up Jesus. So it's not about quoting, a, and I'm not saying this is wrong, about quoting and memorizing and quoting a bunch of scriptures. Um, the word of God is for us, and then as the Holy Spirit brings it to our remembrance, we talk about the Holy Spirit, he brings it to our remembrance, we deliver the Holy Spirit, right? And that was the, one of the topics even in speaking in tongues. So again, what God is doing in us, our lives should be lifting up Jesus. And that's how we draw our family members in. That's how we draw... Uh, that's how we become spiritual magnets or people magnets, a magnet for God, for Jesus Christ in the eyes of other people. So in verse 11, this man is telling his testimony. This man did this, he did that, and he told me to go wash at the pool of Siloam. So it was an opportunity for him to share his testimony. In verse 8 and 9, their curiosity was aroused. And it was opportunity for him to share his experience in God. All right, let's jump down to verse 13. So, and this is how this is what people do, even in our day, right? Verse 13, they brought to they brought to the Pharisees him that aforetime or formerly was blind. So now we need to bring you to the to, to the religious leaders in the temple, in the church. Even though his eyes are open now, even though the miracle is without question, we need to verify this miracle. So we're going to bring you to the religious men of that day. So now we're going to see the impact uh, that it has, on, it has on them. Even though it's viewed as a negative impact, 
verse 13 through 17. They brought to the Pharisees him that was formerly blind. And it was on the Sabbath day when Jesus had made the clay and opened his eyes. So they're going to focus on he did this miracle on the Sabbath day versus focusing on the miracle itself. He violated this holy day versus the blessing. And I think sometimes if as individuals, as Christians, we must be careful that we don't allow religion or religious practices to suppress the reality of God's blessings. God's blessings trump organized religion and how we view religion, what we think about religion, what should happen, what shouldn't happen. God said, my thoughts are beyond your thoughts. So he can do whatever he wants on any day because every day is his day. It says, this is the, the psalmist said, this is the day the Lord hath made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. I'm receiving his benefits. Daily, he loads upon us benefits, right? Psalm 103, daily. So God, the Lord, Jesus Christ, as we read in the Gospels and even today in our lives, he's not regulated by a day or by a holiday. He's not regulated by a set of time. He's not regulated by circumstances or situations as man or as we may tend to view it. God can, God will, God shall any day of the week, any time in any day of the week do what he wants to do. All right. So verses 13 through 17, you can read how that it's this, this influence and impact and the effect that it's having on the Pharisees. All right. So let's move down to verse 18. The Bible goes on and it tells us here. Now we're going to see his parents involved. They're going to bring his parents in, right? And notice the disciples early in the chapter, they said, was it this man's sin or was his parents' sin? So now we're bringing in the family dynamics. So we go to verse 18. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind, had received his sight. I don't know why they didn't believe he was walking around seeing things which he had never done from his birth but again that's people so I, and let me use that and say as Christians sometimes I believe we exert a lot of energy trying to convince men and women and the miracles right in front of them right the miracles right in front of them let the miracle speak for itself we don't have to well walk them down Romans Road and do all these different things unless the Holy Spirit leads us to do that. But the miracles right before them, this man was walking around with his eyes open, which had never occurred in his life. He was seeing a new world for the first time in his life. And the Bible says there were some that did not believe that he who had been blind had received his sight until they called his parents of him that have received this sight. So we need a we need a parental verification. In verse 19, they asked him saying and they asked them saying, "Is this your son who ye say was born blind, who you say was born blind? How then does he now see?" And his parents answered. Now we're going to see the influence and the impact that the religious community can have on people, right? As far as I don't want to disassociate myself from the community that I'm involved in, but I, at the same time, I can't deny the power of God. Verse 20, his parents answered them and said, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind. A mother knows her child. You know that your child was born blind. But notice verse 20, 21, but by what means he now sees or why all of a sudden he can see now we have no ideas and we have no idea and we don't know who opened his eyes he is of age ask him so evidently he was a teenager or young adult or adult they said he's of age ask him you brought him to the Pharisees he's old enough to speak for himself he shall speak for himself verse 22 these words spake his parents because notice they feared the Jews for the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that Jesus was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. So now we see these dynamics. Well, 
he is our son. He was born blind. He now sees. But we're not going to say anything that will get us disfellowshipped or kicked out of the temple. Even though the reality is before us, we want to hold on to our religion. So the question I have for every one of us and for anyone who would watch this. Is your religion greater than God's reality? Is your religion greater than a reality of a relationship with Jesus Christ? The Bible says here in verse 22, I read it to you. They feared the Jews because they said if anyone said that Jesus was the Christ, they would be put out of the synagogue. They would be put out of the church. They would be disfellowshipped. So they didn't deny their, their son who was born blind. They didn't deny he can now see. But they pointed the finger to him and said, ask him. He's of age because we want to protect our status. We want to protect our community connection in the synagogue. But God is God. The miracle is miracle. So now I, re I told you about that scripture in Psalm 150 verse 2. It says, praise him for his mighty acts. There was no praising for his mighty acts here because we're fearing what other people may think. We're fearing what may happen. And Jesus told us that. Not everyone's going to accept us. But let us accept what God has done. All right. Verse 23. Therefore said his parents, he is of age, ask him. Reiterating what they said in verse 21. So again, notice the influence, the impact that it has on all these folks. The man himself, who, the, who received this miracle. The people, you were questioning it. The Pharisees. And now his parents. So when miracles transpire, when the supernatural occurrence happens in our lives or someone else in our lives, uh, someone else's lives that we know, there's, there has to be some decisions made. Either you're going to accept what God did or you're going to try to reason it. And a lot of people try to reason, was it God? Was, was it, did, uh, did he have a surgery? What happened? Versus just simply accepting what God did. And notice, the Bible says in Isaiah, six, uh, Isaiah chapter 1, God said, come, let us reason together. Come, let us reason together. Our reason, I believe this, man's reasoning can cause him to miss the blessings of God. Because it, that's not logical. That doesn't make sense. He was born blind. How, how is it that now he can see who did this? And really, again... In this particular case, in some other cases, it really wasn't about the man being healed or who did it. It was about verse 22, the latter portion. The, the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day said, if any man confessed that Jesus was Christ, he would be put out of the synagogue. So they were strong arming them. If you say, as a result of him doing these miracles and teaching and, and the power of God, yes, you can receive the miracle. Your eyes can be open. You can hear the wonderful teachings of the word of God. But if you say that he's the Christ, then we're going to kick you out of the synagogue. We're going to disconnect you from the community. So many people were influenced by that then, and many people are influenced by that today. People just accept what's going on in their surroundings, in their fellowship. And, and I understand as human beings, we're not perfect, and um, there's no church, per no congregation that's perfect, um, on and on, but we are all a work in progress. But again, we should not fear being disconnected from here or from there, because our connection truly, for every one of us, should be with Christ first. I'm a Christian, right? So this is where we get into where people say, I'm a Baptist, and I'm a Pentecostal, and I'm a Methodist. Well, I'm a Christian. I want to be Christ-like because it's being a Christian that's going to get us to heaven. It's not being a Baptist or a Pentecostal or uh, the association with a particular name or denomination. It's being Christ-like and being conformed into the image of the one who died on the cross, who rose again. That's the reality. These other things are religion, something that we do systematically, if you please. All right. So we talked about the parental uh, impact and on and on. So let's jump down for the sake of time here. 
in verse 34 and 35. Let's move down. Or let's read verse 33. So throughout this conversation, they came to this conclusion. If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. So there was an admission that in order for this man, Jesus, who we don't want to call Christ, he has to be of God because if he, if he wasn't of God, he couldn't be doing anything. Verse 34, they answered and said unto him, Thou was altogether born in sins, and teach, and, and, and dost thou teach us? And they cast him out. So now in verse 34, we see the impact that man has on man. They're telling him, Oh, you were born into sin. Of course we were born into sins. But if you go back to the early part of the chapter, the cause of this man's visual impairment wasn't because of his sin or his parents' sin. Jesus established that from the beginning. But now here in verse 34, oh, that was all altogether born in sins. And now you're teaching us, and they cast him out. So they did what they wanted to do anyway. In verse 35, Jesus heard that they had cast him out. They cast him out of the community. And when he had found him, he said unto him, Do you believe on the Son of God? So, again, Jesus is bringing them to that place that, Okay, this is what man did to you. But now I ask you a question. I put a question before you. He puts a question before us. Some may cast us out, some may disfellowship us. But then God brings it back to the reality. Do you believe? Do you have faith? Do you trust? Do you have confidence in the Son of God? Jesus is now telling him, I'm not the Son of Man. I am the Son of God. Do you believe in me, the Son of the Divine God, Jehovah? I am he. In so many words, Jesus is telling him, I'm the Christ. I'm Emmanuel. I am a, the anointed one sent from God. Do you believe in me? Or do you believe in that system that cast you out? Because you were healed. Notice that. They cast him out of the temple, out of the community, um, the religious community, because he received a healing from the Lord. <laughs> he was healed, and as a result of being blessed, receiving the spiritual benefits of Christ, you get cast out of the church. That doesn't make any sense. The very thing that should be an ambassador for God denies the blessings of God and says you can't be a part of this because you receive the miracle of God. Doesn't make sense at all. But there's a lot of things that man does, we do as men and women, even in the Christian community, that doesn't make sense. So again, uh, there must be prayer, there must be wisdom, there must be an ongoing study and giving ourselves to the Word of God so that we are directed by the Holy Spirit. Because for myself, for you, for any of us, it's easy for us, I believe this, it's easy for us to, based on our knowledge and our exposure of the Word of God, to say, this is how it should be, or that is how it should be. And that's not always in alignment with the Word of God. Well, I can't be a part of this because of that. Or people do various things like here in John chapter 9 based on man's experiences not based on the Word of God this man again going back to Psalm 150 verse 2 Psalm 150 it says praise him for his mighty acts there should have been a, a worship a praise by the people by the Pharisees by the parents by the disciples by all these people it should have been a positive influence a positive impact this should have been rejoicing but yet they had all this conversation going on in chapter 9. Was he born blind? Was it his parents' fault? Was it his fault? We can't believe. Ultimately, they cast him out and it brought, uh, again, it came to the, uh, it's called, I have call it, I've heard it, they say, a come to Jesus moment, a come to Jesus meeting. All right, this has happened to you in your life, Christian. 
but do you still believe and hold on to the truth? Or will you allow the worldly influence, be it, again, within the community of church or community in, 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 in the um, religious, religious community, will that govern and dictate your life more so than a reality in God? That's a question we all have, a question that we all must ask ourselves. What's greater, man's kind, man's thoughts, or God's actions in my life? If I am saved, I'm saved. My salvation came not because I joined a congregation with a name on it. And that's, it's okay to do that. But you and I, we are saved because we accepted, we, Romans chapter 10, verse 9. We confess with our mouth, we believe in our heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. We receive that and therefore we are saved. Not because I put my name on a church roll. I'm a member of this church. I'm a member of that church. We have a congregation of 5,000. That doesn't save you. That doesn't give you a reality in God. You confess with, according to the Bible, the formula is this. Romans 10, 9 and other verses of scripture. Confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, thou shalt be saved. As a result of being saved, uh, he, excuse me, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. By grace are ye saved through faith and not works. So here in John chapter 9, they were all talking about these works, these works, right? And even in our in, in our uh, generation, it's about works, what you're doing in church, what you're not doing. That determines how close you are to, in some people's mind, how close you are to God and how are you not. No. Again, our lives are a testimony. Our lives are the sermon that God wants to use. That Our lives is what draws people to Christ. Christ in us, Colossians 1, the hope of glory. Our hope as well as hope for others. So I want you to think about that as you go back and review John chapter 9 and think about the impact on people, the impact on people. All right. So I'm going to stop it right there. We're going to go into questions, but let me pray and then prepare your questions. All righty. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus, we thank you again for your love and goodness. Thank you for all that you've done. Thank you for the uh, benefits. Lord, we thank you for your word. And we thank you for your Holy Spirit who makes your word alive, brings your word um, into reality in our hearts and our minds we thank you for that i thank you for each one on bible study continue to bless continue to show yourself to be true and real to us and we'll thank you and praise you for it in your name amen and amen